Thank you, Ursula. I'll just uh, share my screen. I hope that's come up properly now. Um, so welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining us in this um, webinar on the Anthropocene. Um, and what I'm gonna try to do today is to reflect some of the kind of social science critique of the idea of the Anthropocene and where um, kind of where geographers sort of sit within it. And I would say that, you know, certainly geography is not a very um, coherent discipline. There's a huge variety of things that's done under the rubric of geography. Um, and, you know, across physical and human geography, we've contributed to defining the Anthropocene in various ways and, and different kinds of critiques of it. But I think there's sort of three main positions that can be identified on the social science side. And so one is people who try to contribute to the idea. So either refining it, defining it, um, active conversation with some of the biophysical scientists who were involved in proposing the idea. Um, secondly, are those who are deeply concerned about the implications of embracing the idea of the Anthropocene. What does it mean, both at the level of what does this mean in terms of environmental change or social environmental change, but also what does it mean um, when we define the present moment and this present socio-environmental challenges within this kind of framing of the Anthropocene. And third are those who try to reframe the idea because they feel that the idea itself is inadequate and maybe we need a different label or different entry point into understanding the challenges of the 21st century. My apologies, it's um, always a little bit of an issue here with advancing slides while being in Zoom. So let's see if I can go to the next one. Great. Um, so all in a name, are we talking about the Anthropocene? Are we talking about the Capitalocene? Are we talking about the Thulucene as Donna Haraway has called it? And what I wanna highlight here that social scientists have been at the forefront of suggesting that the Anthropocene itself is far too anthropocentric. It's a little bit of a kind of human uh, conceit, if you will. This belief that somehow now humans suddenly are emerging as a geological force. And, and also as Ursula mentioned at the beginning that all humans equally are a geological force. And so the sociologist um, Jason Moore has suggested that we should call it the capitalocene to highlight the role of capitalism and the political economy of the modern world and neoliberalism in promoting the kind of damaging relations through which humans are now considered a geological force. Um, and in contrast, I think uh, Donna Haraway, a feminist scholar has taken has tried to propose the notion of the of the Toulousine. And um, I'm not going to pretend that Donna Haraway is easy to understand. <laughs> so I'm, you know, here's my interpretation of what she means by the Toulousine. But I recommend that you look up some of her videos and podcasts and also some of her writings on this because it is quite interesting. But her basic notion is that um, rather than understanding something of the Anthropocene, which highlights humans as a force, she's wanting to highlight the more than human, the complex entangled relations between humans and other species through which kind of change takes place. So she's very interested in symbiosis, but also some of the um, kind of invasive or hybrid or multi-species combinations that um, that sort of lead to radical change in the world. And she goes back to some of the work um, on lichens and on bacteria and, and some of these sorts of things in order to understand it. Um, but I think she's fundamentally thinks it's a bit 
you know, it's a bit uncontrollable. It's a bit unpredictable, kind of tentacle-like. Um, and so if we want to understand the present moment, we need to understand these kind of um, complex, unpredictable, um, messy entanglements of the human and the more than human um, in order to make sense of this time period. But I think what is interesting here is that all of these at some level are kind of deeply anthropocentric in that they are all accepting the fact that humans are now a, a new geological force. Okay, and there, there has been some critique of this, particularly um, from uh, scholars who would argue that even going back to prehistory, um, land use practices do show geological markers. And so while we're deeply concerned about change that we may see today, we would also like to know, um, you know, maybe marking this as a new epic um, has its own set of consequences. Um, so if I turn here to the kind of critical social science interventions into Anthropocene um, uh, debates, what we find is sort of a number, and I mean, there's a number of different critiques, but these are the ones that I wanna try to focus on today. Um, and so one is the fundamental question of what relations show a geological signal? So it's not, you know, most of the geologists and biophysical scientists have been trying to identify something in the geological register, if you will. You know, what can we see in a, that'll show up as a layer in the future in order to mark uh, when the Anthropocene began? Um, but critical social scientists say, well, what are the implications of what we're looking for? You know, it matters if what we're looking for is a shift in CO2 concentrations, if what we're looking for is a change in the fossil record, or if we're looking for impurities um, and these sorts of things. And, and where we mark that kind of change, what is it that constitutes a, a dramatic change? Um, and so I think this is very much contested. What are the relations that that we should be focusing on that may show a geological signal. Um, the second kind of main critique comes out of uh, the idea of temporalities and the making of history. And my understanding is that one of my other colleagues in this series has already spoken about some of the temporalities of the Anthropocene. But here, the point that I wanna make is that social science critiques focus on how the type of temporalities that we define around the Anthropocene actually make history. They, they bring into view particular kinds of relations, particular kinds of events as being important, and they exclude or minimize or erase other kinds of relations and other kinds of events. And so whenever we think about creating a timeline of the Anthropocene, it can never be neutral. And that's probably the most foundational critique that comes from my sort of decolonial and feminist stance that I share with Donna Haraway and Anna Singh and many others, but that, that it's not neutral how we make these temporalities. They're never neutral. So I'm not necessarily gonna argue for the right temporality, um, but rather that we continue to critically understand the implications of how we create those temporalities. Um, and very closely related to this is a critique of the erasure of power. So if what we look at is a change in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, which we might be able to identify in ice deposits or through other sorts of um, even archeological, if you will, or geological um, uh, exploration, um, that this erases the kind of racist, gendered, classed, embodied relations, not only between humans and each other, but humans and the more than human through which those kind of transformations took place. And I'm gonna elaborate on this a bit later, so I'm, I'm not gonna um, carry on with that right now. Um, but finally, and also closely related, is that when we think about 
the Anthropocene and the consequences of the Anthropocene, there are always erasures and exclusions. And so the one of the readings that I had attached this lecture on um, uh, Eric Swingdow and, and Henrik Ernstens Anthropocene, their point in that paper is really about, okay, the Anthropocene is bringing into view a particular set of problems and relations, but it can only do that through the exclusion of others. And the way that it's framed is diminishing um, some relations that we would argue are important around power and politics. Okay, so that takes me quite nicely into uh, thinking about political economies of the Anthropocene. Now, going back to this idea of the capitalist scene, one of the major questions here is what is it that causes anthropogenic change? And I think the biophysical science conversation has focused on the things that may create a geological signal. So it, they focus on CO2. They focus on species extinction. Um, they focus on pla accumulation of plastics. What they don't focus on are things like the factories, the fossil fuel consumption, um, the kind of relations, labor relations that we have, the way that people end up making a livelihood for themselves, the types of farming practices that we have, which then lead to the kind of CO2 signals or the kind of biodiversity loss that, um, that we can identify. Um, and the reason why this is important is that the solutions that get proposed take place within particular frames. And when we erase the sort of um, political economies, the capitalist political economies through which the kind of human environment relations that we have today are created, we forget that it is perhaps those relations that are at stake here rather than just simply stopping CO2 emissions. And so, um, yeah, I'm, and I will just make sure that I don't have another point here. Um, yeah, and when we focus on political economy, it draws our attention to the way that various sorts of solutions that are proposed within a capitalist frame will not fundamentally shift the relations that are currently causing the problems we have. So the example that I wanna give you here is about geoengineering. And for me, geoengineering is the poster child of the Anthropocene. Um, this to me is the embodiment of the, the kind of human conceit around the Anthropocene. So the idea with geoengineering is that the only way that we're gonna solve things like climate change and massive um, species loss is to become actively involved in changing the chemistry of the atmosphere or the changes that take place. And we'll do this through kind of industrial scale interventions. And the image here gives us a few examples like biochar, um, you know, cloud seeding, there's a idea of space mirrors or reflective aerosols in the atmosphere. Um, and there's already some uh, private institutions that are proposing to pilot these kinds of technologies. In fact, um, using Sweden as a base. <laughs> so these are very real and they're deeply disturbing. They are fundamentally embedded in the idea that humans can and should control the complex human environment relations that are taking place. And if I had to say, if I could bring in Donna Harewig in here with her idea of the Tulucine, I think part of her point is, is that these relationships are too unpredictable for us to believe that we can control them. So all of these things that we're putting into place will no doubt cause change. 
but we're unlikely to be able to control them and they're unlikely to have the, you know, the outcomes that we predict or that we think they will have. And as such, um, they're a bit scary for me. Um, but on another level, in addition to the uncontrollability of them is the fundamental point that this remains within the status quo. This is not about fundamentally dismantling relations through which the kind of environmental challenges that we face today have emerged, but it's just a perpetuation of them. It's a continuing of industrial capitalism as being the solution to all of our problems. So um, closely related to these ideas around geoengineering are some of the work that's been done on resilience and adaptation. And here, resilience and the, the Stockholm Resilience Center has been a very important thought leader around these ideas, um, is perpetuating kind of two fundamental narratives, which are very important for us to understand how debates around the Anthropocene are, per, are progressing right now. So one is the idea that change is the norm. Um, and, you know, I wanna emphasize for me, I'm very drawn to this idea. I think it's crucial for us to understand that the world is constantly in change and that dynamism is what animates life. And this of course is a, co a counter idea to the notion of equilibrium and stability that dominated the 20th century in environmental thought. Um, but as part of ideas of resilience, the notion of collapse and renewal as being the way in which ecosystems or different sorts of systems progress um, or change is normal. Um, now, as part of this then has been these ideas that human societies need to become resilient. So a resilient human society is one that can cope. It's one that can kind of manage these cycles of collapse and renewal and the focus on renewal being much more emphasized than that of collapse. In my slide here, I've taken a picture of a house that's being built in um, Northern Nepal after the earthquake had um, decimated most of the buildings in this, in this place um, as sort of an image of the ultimate resilient community putting itself back together after um, disaster. Um, and for me as well, I think what I focus on when I hear these kind of mainstream conversations about resilience and adaptation, ability to adjust, to sort of capitalize on environmental change, um, are the um, kind of the idea of entrepreneurship as well. It's also, again, we're not moving very far out of these kind of fundamentally capitalist relations and understandings. Um, so these sorts of ideas have led to the notion that we need to govern the Anthropocene and that because it's affecting the whole world, it needs to have a global response. So intergovernmental panels such as the IPCC and the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems um, are good examples of this. But also the idea that came from a number of scholars at Stockholm Resilience Center in, in collaboration with their colleagues on the idea of planetary boundaries. So here they've identified nine planetary boundaries um, it's noteworthy that all of these are effectively biophysical. Um, they have land system change here is probably the closest they come to have any kind of a socio environmental concept. Um, that the idea that we can identify their limits, that if we push them be to, for too much change beyond a set of boundaries, we're going to get complete collapse from which we can't recover, or at least the world as we know it would never be able to recover. Um, and as a consequence, they uh, propose the idea that we need to have a global governing system of the environment. Now, this is sort of the exact opposite of what a lot of social scientists are trying to argue for. 
So social scientists are deeply concerned about the politics of the kinds of socio-natural entanglements that we focus on, on what does it mean if we are looking for geological signals as opposed to perhaps embodied effects of socio-natural change that we can gain access to through life histories, through the stories of indigenous peoples and the processes of dispossession and cultural and economic change that they have lived through, or even through the life histories of, um, of people who are considered more privileged and how our embodied experiences of the world have changed even from those of our grandparents um, and what that might mean in terms of us understanding the challenges as we go forward in the 21st century. And the Anthropocene is the opposite of that. The Anthropocene is looking for geological signals. It's focusing on the biophysical. Um, the slide here is a, is a mountain of plastic, um, which is one of the things that they believe they will be able to see in the geological record in the future is this kind of layer of um, waste that's created. Um, so from a social science point of view, rather than focusing on the biophysical, um, we've, the critique from indigenous and feminist and um, racial scholars is about the making of the history that we're creating here. And so instead of understanding the Anthropocene as being dated to uh, like the takeoff of the, of the industrial revolution, they want to tag it to colonialism. Then, and here, this was actually some biophysical scientists, Maslin and Lewis who proposed this and talk about the Columbian exchange whereby a wide variety of important food crops and animals were shifted, not only from Europe, Africa, and Asia to the Americas, but also from the Americas and Europe um, and Africa to Asia. So the, and you know, I always find it really interesting how, for example, the potato is such an iconic uh, subsistence food for the Irish, for the Norwegians, um, for the Danes, my mother's Danish, uh, for the Nepalese. And yet it, this is something that's been in their diet for about 500 years. It did not originate here. It originated in the Americas. And yet it's become so deeply embedded within our cultural practices of food um, that we see it as being a kind of national food, if you will. Um, so this Colombian exchange was extremely profound and it, and it I mean, this is something that they can see in the geological record is all these species are shifting places. But I've kind of bastardized their um, diagram here and I've put people in there. So the history of racism is totally eliminated in this diagram because of course, along with all of these food crops and food animals was the movement of people. And not just the African slave trade, although that was one of the most important, it was also the movement of people from, you know, within different parts of the Americas, from South Asia to East Asia or Southeast Asia. And there were massive um, sort of free or sort of slavery-like and unfree labor relations through which people were moved around the world and became settled populations in those parts of the world. Um, but the other important part of the Anthropocene here is its universalizing tendency. So the Anthropocene narrative is wanting to tell one big story, one big story that can explain change for multiple peoples multiple places, multiple species that are all somehow connected to a time, a time period or a set of practices, as opposed to recognizing that they're maybe much more diverse and much more unruly. Um, my apologies, I think I'm not, yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, so this slide, deliberately doesn't have any images on it. 
And the reason it doesn't have any images is when I was trying to find some and using um, Google images and things to illustrate the impact of colonialism, racism, and white supremacy on uh, the Anthropocene, on why is 1610, for example, one of the proposed dates that, um, going back to my previous slide, that's the date that Maslin and Lewis identify for the Columbian exchange or when the Columbian exchange becomes very significant. Um, but the images that were coming up were so racist that I decided not deliberately not to use any images. So they were either kind of very glorified uh, paintings of white settlers landing in the new world with their big ships and standing there with flags or guns or very kind of in powerful embodied positions, or they were very violent pictures of um, Native Americans attacking settlers. Um, and I was not able to find the kind of images that I wanted, which were ones that might highlight how it was that between 1492 and 1610, 50 million people died in North and South America. Native Americans were decimated and they were decimated through disease, through war, through dispossession. It wasn't just one thing, it wasn't some big massacre, but it was multiple sources of, um, kind of challenging their embodied well-being. And this is actually evident in the geological record because 1610, this concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere goes way down as land use change occurs with native people no longer farming, no longer using uh, fire to manipulate landscapes at the same scale as they were before. Um, and so many people in the social sciences have argued that colonialism, racism, exploration, and conquest are in fact markers of the Anthropocene. And so, okay, we have this dip in CO2 at 1610, but that doesn't really provide us with a particularly gratifying marker. Again, going back to this idea of making history, what histories are they that we want to tell? What histories are we going to glorify and lift up in our telling of the Anthropocene story and in the kind of temporalities that we create? And what are the implications of that in terms of us understanding ourselves and understanding the relations that cause environmental challenges as we go forward um, from here? So within this kind of a story is this critique of universal explanations. So I wanna step back for just a moment here. And um, for those of you who aren't really aware of these critiques, um, enlightenment science, which went hand in hand um, with colonialism, with the age of exploration, um, I mean, they have slightly, I don't want to conflate them, but they are were historically parallel processes going on, um, was very much a quest for universal understanding. So the development of scientific laws, the notion that there were um, relationships in the universe that were stable and fixed, that we could identify through observation and experimentation, and that this would help us to understand the world. Um, and I'm not dismissing, for example, like Newton's you know, theories of gravity, but rather I'm trying to point out the way that enlightenment science led to the erasure of difference. It led to the quest for a universal understanding, which the Anthropocene is very much a product of and still embedded within, as opposed to what is often seen as a more decolonial and feminist approach of recognizing that all explanations are situated. They all arise from the place from which we see, from the social, political, economic, and historical relations through which we are able to 
um, form knowledge at all, make knowledge claims, which knowledge claims become authoritative. Um, and that, you know, the quest for universality is maybe not the only thing we should be looking for. We also need to be understanding difference and making space for other worldviews, other experiences of the world. Um, and, and to me, one of the big challenges is then, you know, but how do we deal with that in an age of alternative facts? <laughs> you know, in an age where we have people who just lie, you know, that's not an alternative ontology. That's just a lie. Um, and so how do we differentiate those things if we're arguing that knowledge is situated? So I don't have good answers to this, but I have questions. I want to give you a brief example about situated knowledges here and why they are so important as we go forward um, in thinking about the Anthropocene and our politics and our solutions. So my colleague Mayor Goldman has done research with Maasai herders in Africa for a number of years. And she has a couple of different papers that talk about the Maasai and, and drought. And one of the very interesting findings here is that the Maasai do have a conception of drought and they do respond to drought and they're very concerned about drought and climate change by extension. But in recent droughts within their areas, there has been a profound difference in how they understand drought. So ontologically what drought is for them as opposed to uh, the scientists who are studying this. So for the scientists, it's um, relatively simple. Drought is defined by precipitation, you know, decline in precipitation. Um, and then they have their own temporality of that, their own time scale and their own set of solutions. Whereas for Maasai, drought is much more related to place and movement. So it is also to some extent tied to the rain, but it isn't this linear relationship with precipitation in the way that it is for scientists. It has to do with access to land. It has to do with their animals and how and when they can move them where, um, such that their temporalities of drought are different. And so when these two things don't line up, it's very difficult for scientists and even development agencies to work with Maasai populations to come up with support and solutions that are actually beneficial for them. Um, and so I'm not gonna elaborate any more on this example because we could also unpack the idea of trying to support and so solve, et cetera. But, you know, but I just wanna say that these kind of ontological frictions, that's what we call them, um, and as well as epistemological or knowledge related frictions are very much a part of what the challenge is in the 21st century. And when we try to reduce that to something called the Anthropocene, um, we tend to erase some of these sorts of challenges. So um, if we turn now to what all of this means, it suggests to us that we need to be taking account of alternative knowledges. And so in an age of alternative facts, if we're not just gonna uh, you know, swallow the big lie, allow anything to be true, um, then how do we go about making space for different kinds of knowledges? How do we go about evaluating them? And what are the knowledges that I'm talking about when I say we need space for, for alternative knowledges. And here I'm turning to the work by indigenous scholars and scholars of race who argue that life stories and embodied knowledges are just as important for understanding socio-natural change. Um, the readings that I suggested have a number of good stories in them, uh, but I was also just seeing something on our favorite um, Anthropocene platform, Facebook, uh, where there was a life uh, history done with a Native American man who was 110 years old. And the way that he talks about the, the markers within his body 
of his experience of being forcibly uh, migrating from the Eastern US onto a reservation in the Western states and the kinds of psychological but physical scars that he carried with him for his whole life um, as a result of that experience. And that's a very different telling of the story of land use change than the one of carbon dioxide emissions or the one of um, you know, a change in political systems, for example, which are some of the other ways that we might go about trying to explain that shift and a shift which you know, people, if we take the ge geological science at face value are arguing will show up in the geological record. Um, also here are the idea that um, relations with the more than human are vital for how we can know anything. So it isn't a case of us as humans interacting with each other, with our brains, with our instruments to create knowledge about the world that's out there, but rather that everything that we know and can know comes from the kinds of relations with more than humans that we cultivate, that we have, that we value. Um, and as such, and now this is very much a um, North American indigenous perspective, that agency and affect, our ability to, to enact change in the world comes from these relations with the more than human, that humans on their own cannot just act. Now think about what this means in relation to geoengineering. These are like diametrically opposed understandings of how we might go about thinking about dealing with the Anthropocene, if we you know, are dealing with environmental change, wide scale environmental change. One says humans need to take responsibility for human agency, human action, and engage in more human behaviors in order to solve the problem with the help of technology. The indigenous perspective says we need to listen we need to focus again on our relations of kin with the more than human. We need to have a different understanding of where our inspiration, where our knowing may come from in order to go forward. Um, and again, I, I recently read this wonderful article in the Smithsonian about a native Alaskan man who was in the hospital in Seattle, I believe it was, uh, very ill and and had a um, I don't know I, I don't want to put any um, value judgments on how I'm um, describing this so he had an insight where he felt he was communicating with a juvenile whale and the whale took him and showed him what his effective experience was of the mother being hunted and killed in the annual subsistence whale hunt by his tribe. And later when he got out of the hospital, I mean, they were able to identify that in fact, the mother had been killed. And, you know, and the, the knowledge and the way of knowing that came and this particular story is kind of told as being somewhat exceptional of somebody who was really able to have communication with another species and an understanding. Um, but again, I don't wanna put any value judgments on it, nor do I want to romanticize them, but I do wanna make the point that there, can, there is a number of alternative ontologies in the world today, whereby peoples believe that we can know from a different basis than the basis of knowing that comes out of modern science. Um, and the Anthropocene, it seems to me, is demanding that we make more space for these kind of diverse life worlds and that we perhaps understand what they might teach us and tell us about the sorts of politics and reactions that we might need to cultivate. So just to conclude here, I'm going to raise some questions um, rather than trying to answer them. And there are questions about what an effective politics of the Anthropocene might look like. 
And for me, the questions that we must ask here are who defines the terms of socio-natural change? What, it, what constitutes social natural change? Is it CO2 emissions or is it the loss of life worlds of indigenous peoples? Whose knowledges are required for us to be able to respond to the major changes of the 21st century? And I think the one, you know, the one real point of convergence and consensus here is that I think nobody is arguing that major change is not happening. That seems really clear. But the question is who's defining that? Who's defining the terms of it? Whose knowledges count? Whose knowledges are required? What is it that we need to govern? Do we need to govern uh, you know, planetary boundaries and resource extraction? Or do we need to discover, uh, govern the making of knowledges, the kinds of inequalities that map out on the landscape, on bodies, on populations, as well as on economics? Um, and who is authorized to manage those changes? Who is it that we think can lead us and how do we go about authorizing them? So I'm gonna stop there and thanks very much for listening.